Good morning. Good morning. We are live. I'm Dr. Aaron Cole, and we welcome you back to our online church, Melbourne. I want to give a shout out, a special shout out to all mothers um, today out there, and happy Mother's Day. May this day be a day of blessing and to honor all your sacrifices you have done for your children. And may God's blessing always go before you on this special day. We welcome you back here on our channel. Um, again, we'll be uh, talking about certain health topics. I hope that you have been blessed in the past few weeks, every Sunday at 10 a.m. in the morning, as Dr. Joe Ten and myself share about health topics that you can learn from and hopefully um, adapting and changing some of the lifestyles that you may see that need a change in your life, that you have been receiving the blessings through these changes. Um, I hope all of you are staying safe in the midst of COVID-19. And today, I will be talking about gut health. We're doing something different this week. It will be the first part of a three-part series about gut health. It is a large topic, so we want to allow some time to really dive into how to improving your gut health. And without further ado, we'll jump straight on to our topic today. It will be part one of our gut health. And the next slide. So our topic is essentially gut health. What is that rumbling all about? And we're going to spend some time today talking about some of the overview about gut health and how you can improve your gut health. And we'll invite Pastor Chris to join us um, to speak to us about what the Bible has to say about our health. A bit of statistics here. Did you know that approximately 50% of all Australians experience gut health problem at some stage at any one time. And about one in seven Australian adults experience distressing gut symptoms, which they tend to manage themselves rather through, you know, taking off some of the food um, to see what's happening. And uh, most gut conditions affect people every day and can significantly in some people impact on an individual's quality of life. Some of the diet-related elements that people may experience include constipation, diarrhea, abdominal discomfort, bloating, irritable bowel syndrome, and some other conditions like diverticular disease are pretty common. And furthermore, an unhealthy gut is increasingly implicated in the initiation and progression as well as exacerbation of many systemic chronic health conditions like obesity and also with type 2 diabetes and heart disease as well. So we're going to talk more about that in our upcoming talk and really about how the gut actually affects our heart. Our next slide, we're going to be talking about essentially, before we go further into it, let's talk about the gastrointestinal tract system. What does it consist of? Well, it starts from the mouth um, all the way to the esophagus and we have the liver, we have the pancreas, and we also have the gallbladder. As you can see on the lower part there on the, on the slide, in the middle is a small intestine. And the intestine will go um, link to the large intestine. And we can see a little tail there, that's the appendix. And that's pretty much, in summary, uh, made up of our gastrointestinal tract. And within our GI tract, it contains trillions of bacteria viruses, fungi, archaea, and other organisms that live within our GI tract. That essentially, these bacteria, viruses, and fungi, and organisms basically collectively are called our gut microbiome. We'll be using this term quite a lot in this talk. These organisms represent over about 50% of our cells within our human body. And can you imagine, it weighs approximately about 2 kilogram in an average adult. And that is quite hefty in weight, considering how small the bacteria and viruses can be. This slide basically shows us um, on the slide where it says, A, are some of the common organisms that exist in your stomach, in your duodenum, which is basically part of your, the first part of your small intestine. And then we have the duodenum and the ileum. And these are the common uh, bacteria. We can see uh, lactobacillus, we may hear that before. Um, they exist within the gut itself, and um, 
bifidobacterium as well and in the colon also have certain kinds of bacteria. You notice that they, some of them share some of the common bacteria and others are a bit different. The composition does change varying due to the environmental factors. So if you see on the slide in B, geographical location, research have shown that shows that there can be a variation in terms of uh, gut bacteria um, depending on where you live. And the mode of delivery, how the baby is born, also contributes to the, the type of organisms within their gut as well. Diet play a critical role in the organism, the diversity of the gut flora within our cells. And we also will find out essentially that genetics can also play a part. Whether we exercise or not, or how often we exercise, can also alter our a microbiome as well. We will talk a bit about stress, how stress or mental health can affect our microbiome and how our microbiome can affect our emotional and mental stress as well, mental health. And we, on topic number two next week, I'm going to talk about the truth about gut health and antibiotics, which play a critical role in our world today where there's a large usage of antibiotics within our era and our community and obviously with age as well as we continue to grow older um, our microbiome will start to change and is vastly different from how it was when you were born there's a few terms that i want to clarify and put out there so that um, you, you can better understand what i will be talking about when i use the term this biosis or symbiosis or gut biome. So this biosis is essentially defined as an imbalance in the gut microbiome community that's associated with diseases. Whereas symbiosis is described as a relationship established between the two organisms, between us, we are one of the uh, organism, as well as the other organism will be the microbiome that we need each other to survive. And we'll find out shortly that our gut health, the bacteria in our gut is critical for our immune system. Now, a lot of people tend to think, you know, bacteria, isn't that <clears throat> something that's harmful for us? Uh, yes, there are harmful bacteria, but there's also bacteria that has a symbiotic relationship with our gut and our body. And we'll be talking about both. So bacteria that we are talking about, like probiotics, we'll be using a lot of these things. Probiotics are organisms um, that reside in our gut and that can help improve our health if we establish a symbiosis. But when we reach a point of dysbiosis, where there's imbalance, where there's more pathogenic or harmful bacteria in our gut, then the, the, the bacteria that are helpful for our gut then we see that imbalance there, and that's called dysbiosis. This slides essentially show that in a healthy gut with a very rich and balanced bacterial communities within our GI system, you can expect to have a normal immune system <clears throat> and how we can play a role in maintaining our health. On the other hand, if we do have a poor and unbalanced bacterial communities, it results in um, symptoms of bloating, um, diarrhea, um, tummy pain, um, and among other issues. And we will shortly know that it can even affect our mental health, brain fog, anxiety, having low moods as well. And it's critical that, that this biosis must achieve symbiosis through the interventions that I'm going to be talking about in the next few weeks to help us to achieve the symbiotic relationship of the gut flora within ourselves. Now, a poor diet, especially one with low in fiber and rich in animal protein and fat, upsets the gut's delicate microbiobalance, um, hence moving towards uh, dysbiosis, reducing the abundance and diversity of beneficial bacterial population and increasing numbers of potentially harmful ones. So what we want to achieve is basically more of the beneficial bacteria populations within our gut and less of the potential harmful ones so that they will not cause any tummy upset. 
Well, the gut is just not a place or an organ that, that absorbs nutrients so that we can get the nutrients and the energy from the food that we eat. But in fact, the gut is a major gateway to the rest of the body and it plays more than just supporting role in health and well-being. Aside from digesting food and assimilating essential nutrients, energy and water, it actively prevents potentially harmful substances. We talked about that when we talk about the um, our immune system in COVID-19. We talk about the um, innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. If you haven't gone through the video, you can always look back in our Facebook or YouTube. Um, and the gut essentially acts as an innate immune system that prevents potentially harmful substances and antigens and pathogens from entering the rest of the body and protect itself from the damage through rapid regeneration and protective secretions of mucus. It also connects with other organs as well, including the brain via the vascular, which is the, the arteries and the veins, and the neural, which is the nerves, and endocrine pathways, the, the hormonic pathway and networks. It has a major input into the control of metabolism of extra intestinal tissues, meaning that, that does not belong to the, the GI tract, and inflammatory responses and our immune system function. So you can see it's just more than just digesting and absorbing nutrients. Um, and there's so much more to that within our gut. Just a little fun fact there. If you lay your gastrointestinal tract across the floor of the field, it, uh, the surface area actually spans across more than 400 square meters, which is a, a more than three tennis court itself. Isn't that fascinating? But the question now is, where do we get our microbiome from? Where does it arise? Where, where does the origin come from? Well, the development of the microbiota is generally believed to begin from birth. Although this concept of that is, is, has been challenged by a limited number of studies which basically detects microbes in the womb tissue itself, such as a placenta, so it might even exist inside um, the, when the baby is inside the womb. But what we know is this, after birth, the GI tract of the baby is rapidly colonized with life events such as you know, illnesses and antibiotic treatments and changes in diet can cause quite a shift within those microbiome. But we know that through birth, as the baby is de delivered, that the, the GI tract starts to populate with, um, um, the, with the microbiome. And it turns out that the mode of delivery does appear to affect the microbiota composition as well, with um, the vaginally developed infant's microbiota containing a high abundance of lactobacilli during the first few days, which is basically a reflection of the high load of um, lactobacilli flora in the vaginal flora itself. So, and uh, in contrast, now, um, you know, we have a lot of uh, emergency and elective caesarean section and uh, we find that babies are delivered from C-section are uh, usually depleted with um, the colonization of bacteriodes genus, but it's colonized by anaerobes such as Clostridium species, which are the harmful species. So we talked about we need to have a balance of good bacteria uh, within our gut, and uh, we find that that is lacking with uh, caesarean section babies. While the fecal mi microbiota of 72% of vaginal delivered infants represents that of their mother's fecal bi microbiota. In babies delivered by C-section, this percentage reduced to 41%. So as the baby tracked through the vaginal canal and being delivered, um, the organisms not only from the vaginal canal, but also those uh, that in the, in, in the fecal of the mom, proves, uh, actually helps uh, feed uh, the baby's gut flora with good flora. Um, it is quite fascinating because we tend to think that some of the fecal uh, material that can be harmful, but um, research have shown that they resemble that and actually promotes the health of the baby. Here it says here, in the first year of life, the microbiome diversity increases and the microbiota, which is also another word for gut uh, biome, compositions converges towards a distinct adult-like microbiome profile uh, with uh, temporal or temporary patterns that are unique to each baby. 
But when they reach about two and a half years of age, the composition of diversity and functional capabilities of the infant's um, microbiota start to resemble those of an adult. And we'll find out why, because uh, we know that diet and certain environment start to change when the environment uh, grows with the, with the parent, what the parent eats and, and the environment that they're exposed to, and you're becoming more like the adult. The microbiota composition is subjected to the shaping by the host and environmental selective pressures. Current research suggests that the diet exerts a large effect on the gut microbiota. For example, feeding methods play a big role as well in some of the bacteria groups in the gut of the babies. For example, um, some of the, the chemicals that produce the sugars, uh, like um, fucosylated oligosaccharides, presence in the human milk can be utilized by Bifidobacterium longium, as well as several species of the bacteriodes, allowing to co outcompete other bacteria such as E. coli and Clostridium. Clostridium. So essentially what it says is that the, the, this certain um, oligosaccharides, chemicals within the human milk that promotes the growth of the good bacteria and out allowing them to outgrow and outcompete other harmful bacteria like E. coli and Clostridium perfringens. While the abundance of bifidobacterium species in breast milk infant microbiota is typically high, this is reduced in breast-fed infants. And furthermore, formula-fed infants microbiota has increased diversity and altered levels of other groups such as E. coli and Clostridium difficile. Did we talk about that, you know, and uh, the E. coli, even though they are part of the gut, but overpopulation of that can actually cause problems for the babies and decrease uh, immune system. And the microbiota on undernourished infants uh, is immature, dysbiotic, and contains greater numbers of enteropathogens, so harmful bacteria. So this is not what we want. So therefore, we always encourage all mothers um, to continue to breastfeed as long as you can, um, at least six months um, before you introduce uh, some of the food that the baby can start to um, have some pure and solid food. And those are critical. And prolonged breastfeeding over more than six months or eight months or 12 months without introduction of solid can result in certain deficiencies in the baby as well. So it is critical to speak to your GP or your dietitian to inquire about some of the health uh, for the breastfeeding and, and health uh, directions for your baby. During the first year of life, the microbial diversity increases. And um, we mentioned about that, that reaching towards um, an, an adult. And um, we see that there's evidence that disrupting the balance of the gut bi microbiota leads to development and progression of obesity, type 2 diabetes, and heart disease. Now, I want you to stay tuned on this one because we're going to talk about that in our upcoming talks. And being overweight and gaining weight has been associated with changes in our intestinal microbiome as well. So that is another evidence that are showing. So this biosis does not only affect the physical aspect of our health, but evidence has shown that it can also alter our mental health as well. So late, a lot of research has been coming up with uh, the gut-brain connection and how what we eat, what happens within our gut has an effect on how we think and our mental health. So a recent systemic review and meta-analysis in 2014 um, basically tells us, includes results from 13 one three observational studies, and they conclude that a healthy diet is significantly associated with a reduced odds ratio for depression. And um, this is quite significant. And we see we are what we eat. And uh, last week, uh, two weeks ago, I did talk about you know mental resilience in COVID-19 and talk about a healthy diet, a plant-based diet to a step towards improving your mental health. And this is exactly what we're talking about. Um, the gut flora within um, our GI tract can affect our mental health. Now, more into that, independent studies have confirmed that an anxious phenotype can be transferred via the gut microbiome. And it appears that both prenatal, um, in the pregnancy, and early life stress, both are risk factors for psychopathology, for mental health issues, and they engender the potential 
deleterious gut bio biota alterations that can manifest during the critical neurodevelopment periods and may persist into adulthood. So what I'm trying to say is this, that there has been showing that a lot of things that life stress early in life or during pregnancy can affect your gut flora that exists in the early years of a child's life and even into adulthood. For example, there was a study being done uh, by Bailey, uh, which monitored the gut bacteria colonization in infant monkeys and um, whose mothers were either undisturbed or stressed during pregnancy, finding a marked changes in the microflora uh, concentration in the offsprings of stress mothers. And uh, another study that they actually done further about this as well, um, they started to investigate the changes in the gut flora um, in primates after maternal separation. So how do they do that? So they started to investigate 20 infant monkeys ages between six to nine months who were separated from their mothers for the first time. So they did a baseline before the separation and after the separation. So all the infants monkeys were found that the typical fecal bacteria, obviously they, they done it on the monkey, it's not um, ethical or rather uh, in, in human babies, but um, so all, human mon all, the, all the infant monkeys were found to have typical fecal bacteria concentration at baseline before the separation and a brief increase in lactobacillus shedding on the first day post-separation and was followed after by a significant decrease in the concentration and lactobacillus in the feces um, after that. So it just does tell us with evidence that the gut microbiota does influence our brain and behavior. And then this is a now rapidly expanding view and started to gain traction in literature and um, largely due to a compelling preclinical evidence that the gut microbiota can influence our, our behavior and the relevance of anxiety and the manipulation of the gut microbiota with the specific problems, probiotics or with antibiotics can influence the depressive light behaviors. Now, this is again another slide. So looking there on the slide on the left hand side, we can see the healthy central nervous system with a normal gut physiology. They work um, with one another. And on the other heart, and the other part of the slides, where there's alter, alteration in your behavior, your cognition, and your emotion, um, that can affect your gut, but uh, physiology as well. And also, having said that, with uh, abnormal uh, gut or dysbiotic uh, organisms within your gut, can also affect your emotions as well. Another fun fact: Did you know that if we lay end to end the total number of bacteria in our body? it will encircle the whole earth two and a half times. Now, that's pretty fascinating too, um, what I've discovered with this. Moving on, a recent trial. So how, do we, how, how, do, how does our gut microflora change with diet? Recent trial placed 10 healthy volunteers either through a plant-based diet or animal diet showing a rapid five-day change in the function profile of the gut meaning that poor and poor quality of Western diet, particularly low in non-digestible fiber, lessen the microbiota in your body. And that basically um, supports fewer anti-pathogenic bacteria, supports fewer number of um, le uh, helpful or good bacteria within our gut. And uh, just within five days, big change. Um, and that, how is this so? Now, we talk a lot about probiotics. But we, we sometimes miss the picture when we leave prebiotics out of the picture because they too work hand in hand. But what you heard a lot about probiotics, you may not heard about what prebiotics is. Now, let me explain to you. So prebiotics are dietary fiber. They're important in maintaining and flourishing the microbiome or probiotics in the gut flora. Essentially, the prebiotics are the food for the probiotics. Now, you can take probiotics pill supplementation, but if you missed out prebiotics in the body, after supplementing with prebiotics and you stop doing supplementing pre probiotics, without the prebiotics, your probiotics cannot survive in your gut. And that gut flora will go back into dysbiotic equilibrium. So you're going to throw that equilibrium off. So essentially what you do, what you need, as much as probiotics are important, you need your prebiotics as well. And how do we get the prebiotics so that our probiotics can thrive within our gut? Well, 
the fact has shown us that most Australians, adult Australians, are not getting enough vegetables and legumes each day. The graph basically shows us that 4.4% um, um, of adults are getting enough vegetables. 4.4, can you imagine that? We need to increase our vegetables and fruits. And these are the prebiotics that feeds the probiotics. It's quite alarming. Now, another slide is going to show you about children. Now, less than 0.4 vegetables. Um, and um, they're having lots of fruits. There are about 30, less than 35% of them are having uh, enough grains. And that's clearly not enough. And it says that more than 95%, we're not having enough vegetables and legumes each day. And we need to change that because that's greatly affecting the microbiome within our body. Now, what are the food sources of different fiber types? We're going to expand on that as the weeks passes by. So there's different kinds, there's essentially four. The first two is a soluble fiber, which contains oats, barley, psyllium husk, and lentils. And the, the other one, are insoluble fibers, which contains whole grain, bread, um, cereal products, and wheat bran, and rice bran, and nuts, and seeds. So in a sol soluble fiber, are basically the fibers are soluble. They contain pectin and gums and found in the plant walls of cells. And the intake of these soluble fibers actually lower your bad cholesterol um, and also can help with constipation as well. While the insoluble fibers contain uh, cellulose and hemicellulose and lignin, and one of the major roles of insoluble fi fibers is to bulk up your stools and to prevent constipation as well. Um, greater intestinal uh, mass uh, reduces the intraluminal pressure, so it reduces the pressure within the gut and it quickens the transit time and increase, increasing your gut um, opening frequency and promotes regularity. So you need, a, a, you need both, isn't it? It sounds like you need both and we need to have both within our diet. The other two uh, sources of fiber are readily fermentable fiber. So what are these? So the health benefits of these fibers are mediated mainly by the products of their fermentation within the large bowel and the fiber essentially feeds the microbiota. So it becomes a fuel for the, for the biome and it's critical in maintaining our health. While the resistant starch which contains chickpeas and red beans and cooked um, potatoes and um, these health benefits of resistant starch are mediated mainly through the products of the, again, fermentation. And this thing about the short-chain fatty acids play a critical role in the gut health and that they are vital for normal bowel function, maintaining the integrity of your, of your bowel and uh, it actually protects against the DNA damage in unhealthy diets as well. And these are really important. So how much should you have all of these? So how much, how much should we consume of? Essentially, all of them. You need to have all of them is important. Eating a wide range of plant foods such as whole grains and fruits and vegetables, legumes are the best way to achieve fiber diversity. You know, the Bible tells us, and God said in Genesis 1.29, See, I have given you every herb that yields seeds, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruits yield seed, to you it shall be for food. You see, I see all the four types of fiber within this verse itself. And it's important for us to have all these things to restore our gut health by eating the right balanced plant-based diet. And, you know, Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Isn't it amazing promises of God? God promised us to have an abundant life. But we need to take charge of our life. It is important that we take control of our life. We can't just simply pray and ask God to bless us when we do not put effort in changing our life. You know, God wants us. Praying is an act of faith, but doing and acting out is a greater act of faith as well because we're believing that God will bless our actions. You know, now's the time we're going to give Pastor Chris a call and I give him a, a call and see how he is. We invite him online to have a chat with us about the restoration of the, restoration of the gut. And so we have Pastor Chris online. Hi, Pastor Chris. Good morning. Good morning, Doctor. Good to see you. Good to see you again. Yeah, I know. We've been meeting up uh, virtually online these days. And um, <laughs> uh, I think uh, the restrictions are coming down pretty soon. And uh, hopefully we can meet in person. But once again, uh, welcome right. you back again um, to our, our session. 
about um, today we talk about you know gut a lot of big words here a uh, gut dysbiosis gut symbiosis i've been learning yes <laughs> So you look, um, we're talking about restoration of our of our gut. You know, Jesus is is he came to restore our health, isn't it, um, Pastor yes. Chris? How does it relate? Yes, absolutely. Um, really? Yeah. Well, I'm just you know thinking about Genesis one, but um, anything anything you can can relate to us and um, in terms of the spiritual lesson that we can gain gain from today's talk. Oh, absolutely. I uh, thank you, Doctor, for your education and for me a lot of big words, but I've been learning. Uh, <laughs> You need a lot of different sorts of fiber too. in my I'm body to get a gut uh, well, uh, to function well. Yes. Uh, it's mm. interesting, as you just mentioned, that a gut, if we messed up our guts, it messed up our mind. Mm. Um, it's, another side is interesting is, if we have a messed up mind, we don't know how to choose the right food. And we'll in eventually mess up our guts again. So it sounds like a vicious cycle <laughs> has it is, been going. It? Right? So I believe that as we come into... We have, we have faith, we're coming to God, that God is able to intervene in that whole cycle. He will lead us to a path to restore not just the gods, also the mind and the spiritual uh, mind. And today, I have some passages here I want to share with you. But before we go in, can we have a prayer? Yeah, let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again. Well, today, we can look at your word. And Father, indeed. Satan is engaged in the business of destroying us. But, Father, you are engaging the business of restoring uh, our health to us. And, Father, I pray as we look at your word today, give us hope and knowing you are able to restore us and you are willing to restore us. So, mm. Father, I pray, give us one spirit and way we understand. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' I'm praying. Amen. Amen. So, the first passage is interesting. Since you're talking about the God is, gr is rumbling. And in the Bible... <laughs> Uh, there are something else is rumbling as well. Let's go mm. to uh, Galatians chapter 5. Let me just uh, read it here a little bit. It's called the flesh. Spiritually termed, it's called the flesh, right? So Galatians chapter 5, if you see uh, verse uh, 17 and 18, 19, I'm going to read a little bit here. Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, said that the flesh sets the desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For they are in opposition to one another so that you might not do the things that you please. If you put in a context what you just talked about, that's yes. the good bacteria and the bad bacteria is kind of <laughs> raging against each other, right? Sounds like yes. that a little bit. And it, verse 18 says that if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Verse 19 says that the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, uh, sincerity, Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousies, uh, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, and factions, envy, drunkenness, and coercing, uh, and the things are like this, which uh, forewarned you, just as I forewarned you, that who are practicing sins will not inherit the kingdom of God. And you look at that, that's, I would call that spiritual rumbling. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just as talking about the bacteria. That's so right. So that's something we don't want in their life. That's a very good observation because I see the 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 the, the flesh and the spirit. You know, um, you know the Holy Spirit and the flesh. We're always tugging each other. It's like a dysbiotic relationship. You know, a spiritual that, bacteria fight or something like that. That's right. That's right. It's the dysbiotic <laughs> relationship in the spiritual realm. You know, where our flesh is, is fighting and spirit. The Holy Spirit is trying to convict us in, in doing the, the things of God, and uh, we see that in the gut as well. That's but we want to achieve that symbiosis, and um, how do we? How do we do that, Pastor Chris? That's right. And let, let, me, let me just finish here. That's the rumbling that you don't want to have in life. Just as Dr. Aaron talking about the, the God's rumbling, you don't want to have that because you suffer from that. How many of us have suffered from envy? How many of us have suffering from imp impurity or immorality? That's something we suffer, right? And mm. now God provides a solution. He says that verse 22, he said that the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. That's something we wanted, isn't it? Amen. So that's why in the Bible, you look at a whole, uh, the totally the Bible, we're talking about God is restoring the joy, the love, the peace, and the patience, the kindness, the goodness, and faithfulness to us. Isn't that something we want in our life? Definitely, Pastor Chris, we definitely need that. And I, 
you know, it, the Bible is such an amazing, you know, the, when, you, when you quoted uh, Galatians 5.22, you know, about the, the, the fruit of the Spirit in 23. That's amazing. That's one of my favorite two verses as well. And uh, possessing the fruit of the Spirit um, to create that symbiosis, reduce that rumbling within our spiritual life. And um, that's something that we ought to have. Yes. Before I go into how, let me mm. show something more here. Uh, yeah. Turn the Bible with me. Go to Genesis, as you mentioned already. Yes. Uh, it's interesting here. In Genesis 1, uh, there's a connection of um salvation or restoring the image of God and also what we're gonna eat. <laughs> I need to uh -huh. make the, the connection here a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So Genesis 1 and you realize that uh, in Genesis 1 verse 27 uh, it says that God created man in his own image. Right? The image here, the inner image of God he created him and uh, male and female he created them. So the image here in the Bible, it literally means that the, the character of God. So God, in the beginning of Genesis, he made man in his own character. And then continue, what did he do? He blessed them, right? He blessed them in verse 28. And then 29, and God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding a sea and it's on its own surface of the earth. That every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be full for you. So there's a connection, and God, very in the very beginning, the first chapter of the Bible, I make man in my image, in my character. I blessed them, right? Mm. And then I give you the food to eat. Mm. It's kind of interesting that that God had a system going here, a perfect system going. Yes. Because of sin came in chapter three of the Bible, Genesis, it destroyed everything. It kind of reversed the whole order here. And thinking about what Adam and Eve was tempted, the first part is the food. <laughs> yeah. And you reverse the order because they eat the wrong thing. And that's why the, the, the image was, they were they don't have blessing anymore. They were cursed, right? The curse upon them. And then after the curse coming and the image of God was distorted as well. Yes. And God, if you look at the whole Bible, if you have time, we can go to Revelation 20, 21, 22. The last two chapters of the Bible uh, the whole revelation or the prophecy is all about God is going to restore the three sins. Yes. His image of God will be restored, and there will be no curse anymore. If you read it in Revelation 21, you'll see that. And then you'll see that the trait of life will be restored to people. So three sins, and God is in the business of restoration. Amazing observation. I really like the observation in Genesis 1, verse 28 and 29. You mentioned about the first thing that God did was, well, when he first 27, God created in his image, the character. Mm -hmm. And then in 28, God blessed them. And then mm -hmm. in 29, God gave them the food. And then you talk about, you know, we've gone so far from where, where we are. You know, we have been cursed because of sin. Um, we, we are not in the image of God. A lot of us are not eating the right diet that God has given us initially. Absolutely. But he's going to bring us into the re restoration in Reve Revelation 21 and 22. Mm -hmm. And that's amazing. That's that's a message of hope, and um, yes, absolutely that's important that we have that message of hope. You know, when we talk about the diet today, as we talk about you know the, the dysbiosis, is basically uh, an imbalance of what we eat and how it affects our mind. And when our mind is not in the right place, it affects our spiritual aspect as well. I think that's really important. But we come back. God is giving us uh, the chance of restoration, and Jesus is the one that restores. Um, I'd love to hear more about what you have to share, Chris. And you realize that's interesting here. Let's go to a, just go to a story here. And we show the connection with what we eat and spirituality. This spirituality mm -hmm. is not going about just something, oh, believe in God. It's actually what we talked about in Galatians chapter 5. The, the indwelling of a spirit, it's called spirituality. The Holy Spirit is able to bring joy, love, peace, kindness to us. But mm. we need to take care of the temple, which is able to have Holy Spirit to come in, which means that what we eat, has a, two effects. Is it going to help us to have Holy Spirit or is it going to defile us? Holy Spirit cannot even come. Let's turn the Bible into Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1 is a very interesting story in the Bible. The Daniel is a prophet uh, in the Bible. And Daniel chapter 1 is a very classic story. And you can see Daniel understand this. Even in the Old Testament time, there's a link between the fool and spirituality. He understands that what he eats is going to determine how is the relationship between him and God. It's very interesting. I want you to just, I don't want to read the whole story. I don't have time today. I would just want to read uh, Daniel chapter 1. 
if you read chapter 1, verse 8, it's very interesting here. Verse 8 says that, but Daniel made up his mind that he will not defile himself with the king's choice food, with the wine which he drank. Also sought permission from the uh, commander that of the office, official, officials that he might hmm. not defile himself. Here's a story. Let me summarize the story a little bit real quick. So Daniel was captured from Jerusalem to Babylon as a slave. He was actually into the University of Babylon, was, uh, was going to tra be trained and become a scholar or wise man to serve in the court of Babylon. So the king is like, hey, Daniel, you come to my university, you're going to be standing at my court to serve me. I'm going to give you the best food in, in the eyes of the pagan king Nebuchadnezzar. And here, the, the Daniel actually was honored. You know, he was eating while king is eating. Thinking about this. Whoa, some of us are actually striving for that, right? When you want to eat the best meal, if you get invited for the banquet of the president, oh, you'll be happy because it's going to be best meal there. <laughs> yeah, yep, right? Daniel it. was there. And Daniel was actually given the honor to eat what a king's choice. Oh. Well, today, if you go to any places, you put anything royal in front of that, must be good. <laughs> yes, that's right. right. That's but right. In Daniel's time, Daniel realized this. Here, Daniel made up his mind, or some version says that he purposed in his mind that he will not defile himself. I want you to pay attention to the word defile. Mm. That word defilement is actually a spiritual term. This word defilement is not just, oh, I'm eating, I'm going to get bad, my gut's going to rumbling. <laughs> it's not just eating the wrong food, I'm going to get some, I'm going to get sick. Here, Daniel, as a prophet, he understood something, that what he eats is going to bring the defilement. It's a spiritual term that he will not be able to have the Holy Spirit. He will not be able to worship God the way he did before. Wow, Which means profound. that Galatians chapter 5, the Holy Spirit is going to bring all that joy, peace, and love and faithfulness to us because his choice of eating is going to defile himself. Daniel, understand, think about this. Daniel living around 600 BC. There's no signs as Dr. Aaron understands. <laughs> Dr. Aaron <laughs> gave us all the insights how the God works. <laughs> right? He doesn't understand that at all. How did Daniel make that choice? That's the question I ask myself all the time. Where, what was the evidence that Daniel based on to make that very choice? He will not defile himself. Mm. There's only one way. It's actually the word of God. Amen. Daniel understood Amen. from the very beginning, there's a connection between the food and spirituality. But let me just emphasize again. Spirituality is not just something personal. Right? It's, spirituality is it's never personal because spirituality impacts how I relate to my wife, how I relate to my kids, how I relate to my uh, parents, how I relate to my colleagues. Do I have the joy? Do I have the faithfulness? Do I have all that thing? So spirituality is never personal. It's something that affects my relationship with God and also with other people. Here, Dan understood that. Eating the wrong thing, <laughs> if, I, if I myself... Am I doing the deeds of the flesh? That is, a, mm -mm, no, no, I'm not doing that. That's why he purposely chose the right food. Well, Daniel did that, followed Dr. Aaron's suggestion. Today we have the knowledge now. We have to pray to the Lord, give us the same discernment. We want to choose the right food so we can have the good spirituality. The Holy Spirit can come in, affects my life, not always God also, and always the people around me. And here, which means that as Dr. Just, Dr. Aaron just said, you are what you eat. If we were eating lousy or eating the wrong thing, our God's rumbling and you start rumbling <laughs> spiritually, it doesn't going to make you a good life, isn't it? But Jesus here was a hope. He gave us the truth, which is set us free. And today we are able to set free from those God's rumbling and also spiritual rumbling. And the truth is in Jesus. He's given us. Daniel understood that. Now today is up to us to accept the truth. That That's we're not right. going to have the God's rumbling nor the spiritual <laughs> rumbling. Absolutely. Well, this is a very profound um, sharing, um, Pastor Chris. And indeed, you know, we we need to achieve. We need to we need to be like Daniel. You know, he purposed in his heart, and he knew, like you said, he didn't have the the scientific evidence, but the evidence comes from God. You know, as I, as I look back on all the things I've talked about evidence we are actually proving what god says is true that he knew what was best for us right in the book of genesis chapter one 
And um, we are constantly striving to, you know, achieve that equilibrium. And science are telling mm. now us now to prove what the Bible says is true. What is the best mm. diet for us? Uh, let me add something more here. All right, you ready for a uh, even deeper understanding of this? This Let's go, Pastor Chris. Let's go. All right. If you continue the story of Daniel, Daniel actually had a say that give me ten days test whether I can <laughs> whether I can be proven I'd be better than those one eating the king's choice, right? So yeah. after ten days, I want you to read. Continue to read Daniel chapter one. If you're reading on um, Daniel chapter uh, seventeen, one chapter uh, chapter one verse seventeen, for the for this for youth, God gave the knowledge and intelligence in every branch. Of literature and wisdom, Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Whoa, he was faithful to what he knew. Right? He chose yes. the good food, not just that his health is better, as if God was able to bless him even more with the understanding of visions and dreams. Listen to me, folks. Listen to me. Because the choice of food he had it, God was able to bless him with intelligence to understand a vision and dreams, then he becomes a prophet of God. He was able to discern what God is going to do because God revealed to him because of his faithfulness what he chose to eat. And today, and today, we are living in an entire quote of the prophecy. We can see the signs around us. The word is ending. It's all described in the Bible. But some of us struggle to understand what the Bible envisions. The reason why is because the choice of food. Because we don't, we don't have the good food. We have a messed up or God's messed up their mind. You'll not be able to understand the signs that God has been telling us. And God is preparing us for the end time. Everything that happened around us is just recorded in the Bible. But for, in order for us to understand, you're going to learn from Daniel. You're not going to defy yourself. That you can understand. God will give you the intelligence. You're faithful to him. Absolutely. And you'll be able to understand the signs and the prophecies and the dreams and visions. As you want to be a serious Bible studies, as a Bible study, you cannot be serious about what you're going to eat. Because you can see the link in Daniel chapter 1. There, if there's no Daniel chapter 1, there won't be Daniel chapter 2. <laughs> because right. when God revealed the dreams of Nebuchadnezzar, he won't be understanding. Absolutely. That's why what he eat, Daniel chapter 1 verse A, it links our little foundation of the rest of the book of Daniel. Jesus talked about it. If you want to understand the end time, the desolation, go back to the book of Daniel. Let yeah, him understand. So Jesus gave credit to Daniel. The reason why is Daniel was faithful. Daniel was faithful while he eats. And through that, he was blessed. Today, so do you want to be a serious Bible study? Absolutely. Sorry, I'm just getting excited. No, no, no. It's all good. Pastor Chris, so essentially, we need to purpose within our hearts. Um, to, to eat right so we can have the symbiotic relationship with God and not the disbiotic Absolutely. relationship that we're having. You know, we've come to a time that we want to open up to the floor for questions and, and answers. Um, we, are, we are a bit over time here, but, you know, I, do, I didn't want to stop you because you, you had such a great point on there that I believe our listeners will be able to take away from this. But now is the time for questions and answers. Uh, anyone who wants to post on Facebook, please let us know. Any questions for myself or Pastor Chris, we are willing. We are happy to answer any of the questions. You know, I'm just, I'm just while we wait for the questions, we want to remind everybody that this is the first part of a three-part series, how to improve your gut health. And uh, a lot of research have shown us uh, some of the things that we need to know about that. We have one question that came through. Um, uh, can't tolerate. So what do you think? So from Henry Toe, what do you think about eating foods with good bacteria like yogurt? And what about people who don't eat or can't tolerate these foods? Okay, so we can achieve, um, which I'm going to talk about a lot more in the next talk because we're going to talk about how antibiotics can alter our gut flora and how do we replenish all, all these things. Well, just to, um, just depending on where you are at this stage in terms of your gut um, uh, flora, uh, which stage, but yogurt does contain good bacteria, lactobacilli, yeah. and among others. And, and uh, some yogurts contain high sugar as well. So we've got to be very careful. You know, we, uh, Dr. Joe can talk about the high sugar as well. How do we balance between all these things? There are a lot of other, other things that we can, we can get good bacteria from. And um, essentially, you know, having uh, 
for example, that I'm gonna not gonna talk too much about this this week because we're gonna we're gonna leave some space for for, for next week. Um, the thing is that there's many ways. One of the ways, aside from if you can't tolerate yogurt, you can go for probiotics, uh, probiotics uh -huh. supplementation. Uh -huh. So those are the things that can help as well to replenish your gut flora. Now, uh, while that is important, we need, we talked about the prebiotics as well, and those are essentially crucial. Without the prebiotics, the probiotics would not maintain the symbiotic relationship within your gut. And uh, true, yogurt can do that as well, but there are other options which I'm going to talk about next week. Um, any other questions coming through? Um, Susie mentioned about choosing food is a moral choice. It is from the mind. Um, from small battle, Daniel's choice based on obedience, but the subsequence, uh, I'm, I lost that one there. I've got to go to my phone uh, and check the, all right. I think Susie had a, had a comment more than a question. Yeah. Would you want to uh, maybe reach out the questions? I'm just trying to get access to the, Well, Chris, have you got the questions with you? Would you like to read out for I think, us? I think she's just making a comments more than a question. So okay, okay. Praise God. Fair enough. Um, what what uh, what comment was she making? She said, "Choosing food is a moral choice." Oh, it's a moral choice, absolutely. It is from the mind, which is small battle. A Daniel's choice based on uh, based from obedience, but he the consequences because he might he he may never had experience unclean food. Yeah, that's the common from Susie. Sure, not a problem. Um, was there another question? Another Cooked question. and cool for fiber. Fiber. Uh, uh, Susie had a question. Cooked the cooled potatoes. You mentioned from ah. the PowerPoint for fiber. Yeah. They have it. Sure. Uh, okay. So, yeah. Um, look, I I think uh, essentially. I don't think there's much, not much of a big difference uh, from the hot cold and cold. I'm not sure why when I chose that as well, um, uh, hot and cold potatoes. Um, I suspect that it might be due to the the, the breaking down of the, um, the the components within the, the potato itself. But you know, if given a choice with normal potatoes and sweet potatoes, I'll definitely lean more towards sweet potatoes because of the low GI effect and the healthy effects of of sweet potato. So, um, you know, hot and cool doesn't really matter as long as you have some potatoes. And Jojo has, has one message come through. Are there lots of probiotic supplements out there? Are they not effective with prebiotics? Um, they are. Look, it depends on, um, you know, there's, there's different kinds of uh, probiotic supplements out there. We have a lot of choice. For example, you know, there's a lot of multivitamins out there. We have a lot of choice as well. Now, the key thing with the probiotics, which I'm going to talk about a lot more again next week, is that it, um, it doesn't really in particular matter uh, which one you go for but the crucial part is that you supplements are in fact supplementing what we are eating so it does not negate the fact of healthy eating we cannot say you know we um, are someone who who indulge in a lot of alcohol um, or a lot of uh, unhealthy food and supplement himself or herself with probiotics trying to achieve that um, uh, symbiotic balance. No, we can't. We can't do that, and that's not. It doesn't negate the effects of that. And research will. I will continue to show you that it doesn't show that because there are certain things that we do do cause inflammation within our gut and essentially wiped out some of the the good bacteria within our gut. And um, the probiotic supplements. There are a lot out there. Um, I do not want to give a specific brand per se. But we will definitely talk about that next week. So stay tuned and how you can improve your gut health through supplementation or the food that we eat. I am echoing again for some reason. Uh, let me... All right. Anyway, um, any more questions coming through? You know, it, it is amazing, like, uh, we, we also know, while we're waiting for more questions, is that uh, we need to have fiber within our diet for our gut health. But also, as well, we know that having high fiber in our diet does decrease our risk for colon cancer. And that is really important to have that in our diet. And um, it is uh, also help us as well. 
um, um, we can do yeah, that yeah. in, well, I've got questions coming through again. Them. Sorry, I've just been distracted by that. <laughs> uh, probiotics are food, for, so it's good to have them together. Prebiotics are different to probiotics as well. So probiotics are the food for the good bacteria. So just to clarify again, so probiotics are essentially the, the bacteria or organisms within our, our gut. Um, and those are the, the good bacteria that exist. I did show you the program, uh, the slide about the different kind of bacteria. Now prebiotics are the food for the probiotics. They are the fiber. We talk about the soluble and insoluble fiber, fermentable and non fibers, all of which compose food for the probiotic. So we should have fiber in most of our meals, not all of our meals. And that provides food for the probiotics to thrive on it. The research has shown that as, as, as quick as only five days, by changing uh, uh, into a fully Western diet, it can change the microflora within our gut. So we need to maintain that. I think Pastor Chris talked about, you know, we need to be maintaining um, our symbiotic relationship with God. We need to maintain our symbiotic relationship with the food that we eat and in our gut flora. So that has to be the staple um, for that one. So we need to do that. Um, all right. So, um, yep. I th any more questions coming through? Uh, personally, um, I have a longer colon. Okay. Um, I'm just uh, wondering how you find out about that. But anyway, in this case, how much fiber do you recommend? So um, the current guidelines recommend between 20 to, to 35 grams of dietary fiber a day. And um, that should be the aim that we, that we go for. So half your plate should be contains fruits and vegetables. A quarter of your plate should contain some of the grains. You can have complex grains, um, ancient grains, and then for protein, a one quarter as well. Things like tofu and legumes and everything. So in all these three aspects of the food, you are actually getting enough fiber. There are some people who, even though they may be vegetarians and find that they, they are still struggling to get enough fiber. So how do we go about doing that? Well, one of the ways that you can do to supplement your fiber is through psyllium husks. So if you have heard of psyllium husks, psyllium husks is a, is a main component of, you may have heard of met metamucil. Uh, it's a mineral component in metamucil. And uh, what you can do is basically in the morning, when you wake up in the morning, have a glass of water. The second, after you're having a glass of warm water, you have the second glass of warm water. And you have two teaspoons of psyllium husks, depending on how much, and you need to tailor to that. And just stir it and drink it immediately. So that can supplement more fiber in your diet, uh, in, your, in your diet as well. Um, we, we will talk about um, your bowel health next week. How, what do you mean by achieving normal bowel habits? We're going to talk a bit more about that, and we will expand a bit about the fiber as well. Um, Let's see. If we can't, as another Justin, we can't in, in, include if we can't include prebiotic food sources in our diet. What would you recommend? So it's coming back to the same thing as well. Um, if we can't include enough prebiotic food. So essentially, if we are vegetarian or if you're not, you're not getting enough fiber. Uh, psyllium husk is one of those measures that you can you can put in place to have a healthy gut flora in your diet. All right, so I, there's a lot of health questions coming through, Pastor Chris. Probably praise of the Lord. And uh, what we'll do, I think we'll come to a time that we need to close with a little prayer. But I just want to announce to everybody again, every Sunday at 10 a.m., we will be here at Online Church Melbourne. And thank you for all who have been supporting us. And please share with those people who you think that may, might be beneficial for them. And I pray that, Lord, that you will continue to make changes in your life learn new things, that God will continue to bless you in the best of health. Stay tuned Amen. for next week. We'll have another health talk about the, 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 truth, the truth about antibiotics and your gut health. And following that, the week after, we're going to talk about the heart and the gut axis. What you eat can impact your heart health. So these are the three talk series that we'll be talking about. And Pastor Chris, once again, we thank you so much for joining us. I know you're a busy man. You're doing a lot of things uh, for the church and your ministry. And it's our prayer that you're, you continue to further the work of God. Um, Pastor Chris, any last comments that you want to give before um, I ask you to give close with a word of prayer? No, maybe I just have a word of prayer. We're close sure. and we will 
Okay, read it again next week. Absolutely. Thanks, Pastor Chris. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for the time we can spend together. I thank you for Dr. Aaron was passionate about health, not just physical, but spiritual health. And Father, I want to pray for all the viewers from different world, different part of the world. And when they're watching this, to understand, even though uh, we may be we have been far from uh, physical health, spiritual health, but Father, you are the business of restoring us. And Father, I pray when we come to you, we'll be able to have the good health, physical health, and spiritual health. And we'll be ready before you come again. And give us the desire that we will not defile our body uh, physically and spiritually. And then we can be restored into the image of yours again. Thank you, Lord, for the promises and for the power and willingness you have to restore us. I pray that you give us heart to seek after your righteousness, your kingdom. May everything will be added unto us. Thank you, Lord. Bless us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Pastor Chris. Thank, Thank you, you, Doctor. So I'll see you again. Have a good weekend. Have a good weekend to you.